It is your host, Alyssa Scaleri. Welcome back to another episode of the Light After Trauma podcast, and most especially, happy 100th episode. We are officially in triple digits. I don't know how that happened. I have no clue. It has been almost two years since the podcast started, and I can't even wrap my brain around it. We are 100 episodes in and it has been so much fun every step of the way. You know, I remember being in the pandemic, like right at the beginning when everything was supposed to shut down for only two weeks. And I remember thinking to myself, like, I have to do something to help people that are suffering. I have to do something to help people have a greater understanding about mental health. And it sort of just dawned on me like, oh, I really want to start a podcast that is a great way to reach people and to be able to provide people with like free access to like mental health education. So I, you know, remember, like I get all these reminders on my phone from like Facebook, I guess, like as my equipment would come in, like my podcast microphone, I would take a picture of it and I would put it on my story. So I keep getting like little reminders on my social media from that, like two years ago. And it's just, it is mind boggling. And I am really honored to be here. There are times when the podcast has really stressed me out and has felt like a lot, but honestly, for the most part, I have been loving every second of it. And I have formed friendships with, I think just like so many of you, I have amazing friendships right now that I would have never had if it weren't for this podcast, whether it's people who have been on the show, whether it is people who have contacted me after hearing the podcast and we just connected on social media. I just feel like I have friends all over the world and you have been right by my side, listening to me, not just share my story, but, you know, be vulnerable because I shared my story, but I share my story for the most part as I'm going through things. And it has been great to feel the support. It has been great to be able to give support in the form of like, you know, education about mental health. It It's just been great. It's all been great. That's like I don't even have any words. I don't have any words. So if you and I have talked and we're friends, thank you. I love you. If you and I have never spoken, but you just listened to the podcast, thank you. I love you. We are going to keep going until I don't know when. I don't know. We're just going to keep going. We're going to keep doing it. So thank you so much for all your support. I would honestly never be here without you. And if you are continuing to like what you hear and you haven't done so already, I kindly ask that you please leave a rating or review of the podcast because those ratings really help the podcast to continue to grow and to reach a wider audience so more people can get the mental health education and support and the trauma-focused education that they need. That would be great. And without further ado, let's get into it today. So I thought for the hundredth episode, we could talk about something maybe a little bit more fun. I mean, listen, I always think that mental health stuff is fun, but of course it can be very, very serious. So I thought maybe we would just like dial it back a notch and talk about something that I think is a really cool. So today I wanted to talk about the five love languages, which I always think are interesting and relate to absolutely everybody. The five love languages, I'm sure most of you have heard of this, but if you have not heard of this so far, I mean, It's based on a book by a PhD, Gary Chapman, who was a therapist who worked a lot with couples and with, you know, people in complicated relationships. And he wrote this book titled The Five Love Languages. And the book was released 
in 1992. And basically what this book is, is it's a collection of his extensive research as a therapist. And he takes kind of like everything that he has seen throughout his career and he condenses people's communication patterns and how couples communicate love. He condenses it all into five basic categories and calls them love languages. Now, it's important to remember about love languages that when we talk about it, it's not just between romantic partners, right? Love languages are, it's quite literally how we express our love to the people in our lives that we want to express love to, but it's also how we like to be loved by the people in our lives who love us. So it is both. So these love languages are not super old. It's, you know, a a definitely a newer concept. Like I said, it came out in the 90s, 1992, specifically the year I was born. So it is as old as I am. It is 30 years old, which is not very old. And if you're listening out there and you think 30 is old, we need to talk. I'm just kidding. Kind of ish. Anyway, so what are the love languages? All right, let's break it down. So we have words of affirmation. We have physical touch. We have receiving gifts, quality time, and acts of service. And we are going to get into what that means. So what are words of affirmation? Well, it seems kind of self-explanatory, but basically it's using your language to tell somebody that you love them. And it's not just, I love you. I love you. I love you. It's more like you are verbally encouraging somebody. You are validating them. You are affirming them. You are actively listening to them and giving them feedback. And that feedback is really encouraging. Like this is is the person who is, is a talker. Like if you need to just talk through things and you need to hear validation, you need to hear reassurance constantly, you might be a words of affirmation person. That might be your love language. Now, I think it's important to note that I think you can have multiple of these. I think that every relationship needs all of these. And I'm not a couples therapist, right? So don't quote me on that. But I kind of look at all these and I'm like, I think that all of them are important. So this isn't to say that, you know, you only need one for a relationship to survive, but rather it's like, there's usually one of these that rings more true for you than it does for any of the other ones. So folks whose love language is words of affirmation, they really appreciate things like handwritten notes. They like cards for birthdays and anniversaries. They love it when you send them like a text in the middle of the day, just, hey, I'm thinking about you. I love you. They love that stuff. That is how they feel the most loved. Now, maybe this isn't how you like to receive love because personally, it's not how I like to receive love. And I'm not saying words of affirmation are bad. Like I like them. They're great. I I like when my partner tells me that he loves me, but I don't like need it. It's not my oxygen, so to speak. But maybe you are somebody who gives words of affirmation and that is how you communicate your love. So you can have one love language that's your way of communicating love to others and a totally different love language that's your way of liking to receive love. And that's definitely the case for me. I tend to be a words of affirmation person when it comes to giving love, which honestly, does that surprise anybody given the fact that I'm a therapist? 
like, is anybody shocked by this? No, I totally show my love and my care and my concern with my clients and my friends and my husband by words of affirmation. I'm actively listening. I'm encouraging. I'm affirming people all of the time, you know, and and this is not with my clients, but with the friends in my life, with the loved ones in my life and with my, you know, my partner, I will make handwritten cards or I will send like an unexpected note. I know I used to do those things when David and I first started dating. I don't so much anymore, although I probably should now that I think about it, but that is something I am much more likely to do. But when I receive things like that, I like it, but it doesn't necessarily just like do it for me, if you know what I mean. So the next that we're going to talk about is physical touch. When people hear this physical touch as a love language, everybody's brain jumps, not everybody, right? But most people's brain jumps to the same thing, which is sex. They're like, oh, if your love language is physical touch, then you just want to be having sex all of the time. Uh, I've had <laughs> so many people that I've spoken to about love languages, you know, who, who didn't really understand what physical touch meant. You know, when I say my love language is physical touch, because that is my love language, people look at me almost like kind of sideways. And I'm like, that's not what it means. Right. Yes. When it comes to physical touch, sex and intimacy can be a part of it. And that is a part of it. But there are other things that are also really important when it comes to physical touch. And it's more just like nonverbal body language, right? So I like hugging. I kind of like kissing, but I'm, I'm more like hugging is where it's at for me. But also I like when somebody, somebody, when I say somebody, I'm talking about like, I'm talking about David. I like when David will like play with my hair or like, just kind of like give me like a foot rub or, you know, just rub my back, like whatever kind of physical touch again, non-sexual. I love it. It is the best thing ever to me. Now, on the same kind of topic, I don't really appreciate, not that I don't appreciate it, but I don't show my love through physical touch. You will not see me opening my arms and reaching out to like hold somebody and like initiating any kind of physical contact. I don't do that. I think because I, it's definitely partially due to my history of sexual abuse. I, I like touch, but it's somebody that I have to feel really, really safe with. So I'm not likely to go right to physical touch as a love language for like friends or, or acquaintances or anything like that. And again, it's not that my friends aren't safe people. Like my friends are incredibly safe people. It's more so just that I feel like there's a different level of safety that's accessed with David that just sort of makes me really be able to like tap into my desire for physical touch without having my, my defenses up or my nervous system kind of reactive as a result of my sexual trauma. So physical touch is my number one. That is my love language, but I am not really one to give a whole lot when it comes to like, I guess I should say, I'm not really one to show my love through physical touch. I like to receive through physical touch. So the next one is gift giving, receiving gifts. And this one really, again, is exactly as it sounds. It's it's putting thought into buying things, not even buying things, making things. It could also be like, hey, I made you muffins. When David and I first started 
dating, we would often bond over like our love for food, which honestly we still do. That has never gone away. And where I lived with my parents, there was this really great Italian shop with the best cannolis. And so he also loves blueberry and they made blueberry cannolis. So I would often like, we worked together. We first met like at work together. So I would often bring him like blueberry cannolis to work. Aside from this, though, I'm not much of a gift giver to the point where if I have like a close friend whose birthday is coming up or even if like David's birthday is coming up, I panic over what I'm going to get somebody for their birthday. It is such an anxiety thing for me. I'm like, okay, well, I know, you know, I know this person loves, I don't know, plants. So I think I'm going to get this person a plant. But what if I pick the one plant that they hate? Or what if I pick the one plant in the world that they happen to be allergic to? Like that is just so my like intrusive thoughts. Like I just think about all the ways in which my gift is going to be the worst thing ever. And so gift giving gives me too much anxiety. I, I don't like it. I mean, I, of course can receive it. I actually get very overwhelmed when people give me gifts. Like I will cry happy tears, uh, but I will still cry. I very much enjoy receiving gifts, uh, but it makes me like very emotional that somebody would even like think of me and be so kind as to give me a gift. So I definitely enjoy receiving this uh, as, as a love language, but I have way too much anxiety to be able to really like give it. And when I say it, I mean like any kind of like thoughtful gifts or thoughtful gestures. So then there is quality time. And this is really just when somebody spends uninterrupted time with you, uninterrupted off of their phone, not on social media. And it's, it is one-on-one time. And this is, I think a big one for a lot of people. And I think in particularly a lot of like childhood trauma survivors, especially if there was like neglect involved, people really tend to to love that one-on-one time. And that's not to say that your childhood trauma is going to drive what your love languages are. That's certainly not the case, or at least there's no research to my knowledge that is, you know, supporting of that. But I do think that sometimes it can play a factor. So quality time really is creating like special moments, right? Let's go for a walk. We're going to have date nights every week or every other week. We are going to go to the gym together. We're going to ride into work together or Friday nights are pizza and movie nights. Again, like I think that these things are important for every relationship and friendship. I think quality time is of course very important for a friendship. But I think the question is, is that the most important thing to you? I this would be probably my second like m- love my second most important love language aside from physical touch. I also really communicate my love with other people with quality time, you know, Hey, let's hang out. Let's do something. Let's go here. Let's go there. Uh, now that I've recovered a lot from my trauma and I don't have as much anxiety around seeing people, I really am somebody who enjoys quality time. So then there's acts of service. That is the Last one, but certainly not the least. And this is just letting somebody know that you want to help them, lightening their load, doing tasks for them. Hey, I'm going to take your car. I'm going to go get your oil changed. Or, you know, hey, I decided to make dinner tonight because I know you had a really long day. Or it can be even something so small as like, Oh, hey, I fed the dogs this morning because I know you had a meeting. It doesn't have to be monumental. It can be very minor. I made you breakfast. You know, I hung a load of laundry, like could be very small things. Acts of service is absolutely the way that my husband 
likes to communicate his love for me. He is a huge acts of service guy. He does so much for me, whether it's cooking, whether it's cleaning, taking care of the dogs, like he will do anything for me. And it is really, really awesome. Now, I think in terms of like how he likes to receive love, I definitely think it's quality time. I think he like really appreciates quality time. So those are the love languages. Now, here's what's really important about these love languages is I think for many, many couples and many different kinds of friendships, love languages can be a little bit difficult because we have to learn a lot about the other person and what their needs are. And it's sort of like, well, what do we do when our love languages are completely different? And I think that when you're with somebody and your love language is totally different than theirs for trauma survivors, a lot of times for childhood abuse survivors, it can be really, really triggering because we may not necessarily see that. Like, you know, I may not see that my mom's showing me love by acts of service, buying me, you know, buying me clothes, cooking for me. I may not see that as love. And I may be upset and feeling unloved because I'm not getting hugs or cuddles from my mom. You know, that is sort of a miscommunication, right? It's I'm not seeing that you love me because you're not loving me in a way that I can see. You're loving me in a way that only you can see. So this is why love languages are so important. Like, yes, they're fun to talk about, but they're actually really important for the growth of any kind of relationship, whether it's romantic or not. And when we have childhood trauma, we are already used to not getting our needs met and our brains are already like hypervigilant and extra wired for protection. So as soon as we see that our needs aren't getting met, right, maybe your, your love language is quality time and your partner is not making any time for you. You know, they will hang a little laundry and they mow the lawn and, you know, they cook, but maybe they haven't planned like a date night. Well, here you are triggered, feeling abandoned, unloved, maybe worried that something is going wrong in the relationship because your needs aren't getting met. So you're triggered because you can't see that they're expressing love through their way. So I think that it's really important to not only ask yourself, what are my love languages, but to also ask yourself, what are the love languages of those people around me? And you don't even have to ask yourself because If I were you, I would go straight to the source, go right up to your partner, talk to your friends. What are your love languages? Because once you start to realize, oh, hey, this person never hugs me, right? I have my best friend. My best friend never hugs me. This is not a true story, but my best friend never hugs me. You know, when she sees me, you know, we see each other twice a year and she never hugs me. She only waves. I feel like she doesn't even want to be my friend. Meanwhile, right, she might not be hugging you, but meanwhile, right, she lives in another country and she spent money on a plane ticket, traveled halfway around the world to spend a week with you, like quality time. Or, you know, could that be acts of service, right? Maybe she doesn't hug you when she sees you, but when you guys aren't together, she's texting you all the time, you know, giving you words of affirmation. Like, it is really important to fully assess all of what is going on sometimes when we're feeling triggered or we're feeling unloved. Like, is it that I'm being unloved right now? Or is this person expressing love to me in a different way? And if that's the case, right, if somebody is expressing love to you in a way that you don't necessarily receive, that's the time to have a conversation about it, because I think you have to decide like, okay, what do we do and how do we compromise so that we both get our needs met? You know, like my husband likes quality time. I like physical touch. So 
we we compromise, right? While we spend quality time together, while we are sitting down on the couch watching a movie together, you know, I'm getting a foot rub or we're holding hands or he's rubbing my back or, you know, he's he's playing with my hair. Like, how can we compromise on this so that both of our needs get met? It is a really important conversation to have with your friends, with your partners, with your loved ones. But the I think one of the really important things here that I also want to say is to not confuse abuse with, oh, our love languages aren't the same. Because I see that happens or can happen, right? Like love languages aren't to be thought about when you're in a situation where your partner is abusive or controlling or manipulative, right? It's That's not where we want to justify somebody's behaviors based off of love languages. So be careful not to justify abuse based off of somebody's love languages, right? And this is kind of an egregious example, but just to kind of show you what I'm talking about, it wouldn't be appropriate to say, well, when I was a child, we never had any food or hot water in the house, but my mom was always home with us. You don't want to justify neglect, So that is really important because I do think that some people do that, not maybe necessarily with like child abuse and neglect, but I do see it happening a lot with romantic partners, right? Well, oh, he's, he's mean to me and he talks down to me because words of affirmation aren't his love language. He likes physical touch or, oh, you know, I need to be open to having sex more because his love language is physical touch. Therefore, I can't say no, right? Like those are things to really think about. And I highly recommend talking with a therapist about to make sure like, yes, can it be the case that one partner may need to work on their, you know, being more intimate perhaps, right? But we want to make sure that we talk to a therapist about that and make sure that it's not the case that your partner is pressuring you inappropriately so to have sex. So I hope that that makes sense. Uh, You know, and I think it's a very, very important takeaway when we talk about the five love languages. So these are really fun I absolutely love them. And if you don't know what your love language is, there are like a gazillion quizzes online that you could take to find out. You can also send the quizzes to your friends, to your partner, to be able to find out. And it's a fun way to, I think, get to know each other a little bit more, you know? And and again, if you have any questions or concerns, like, was this abuse? Am I confusing love languages? Is this okay? Please make sure that you talk to a therapist or to a, you know, a professional about it. I strongly encourage that. (sighs) So that was that. That was a wrap on episode 100, which was so fun. Thank you again for being here with me for 100 episodes. I love you all. I am holding you in the light and I will see you next week. Thanks for listening, everyone. For more information, please head over to lightaftertrauma.com, or you can also follow us on social media. On Instagram, we are at lightaftertrauma, and on Twitter, it is at lightafterpod. Lastly, please head over to patreon.com slash lightaftertrauma to support our show. We are asking for $5 a month, which is the equivalent to a cup of coffee at Starbucks. So please head on over again. That's patreon.com slash lightaftertrauma. Thank you, and we appreciate your support.